This is Derek Atkins, and this video is for the Theology 2 course at the East Asia School of Theology. This video lecture is entitled Humanity Made in the Image of God, and this is part two of our video lecture. So if you have not yet watched part one, please take some time to watch part one. So, in part one of this video lecture, we have been looking at the question, what does it mean to be created in the image of God? And what we've seen is that the Bible clearly teaches that we are made in the image of God. However, one of the strange things is that the Bible does not really um, elaborate or explain what the image of God really is. And so this lesson um, is an attempt to explore a bit more and to try to come to a better understanding of what the Bible means when it talks about how we are made in the image of God. So now we are going to look at um, a view of some that who say that the image of God should be understood as sonship. Um, the notion of sonship is a broad concept which includes several factors. This view was argued by H.D. McDonald in his The Christian View of Man. Under this view falls many ideas including human rational and moral capacity. One part of this view says that Adam is created in God's image and is also said to be the son of God. This um, view takes Luke 2, 30, 338 as its starting point. Note also that the image and likeness of Seth to Adam is also based on the idea of sonship in Genesis 5, 1 through 3. Christ is the true and ideal son of God. Because of this, he bears the image of God. See Colossians 1, 15, as well as First, I mean, as well as John 1 14 and John 1 18. It is to sonship that we are restored. This is the purpose of salvation. See John 1 12, Romans 8 14 and 16, Ephesians 1 5, and Hebrews 2 10 and 11. So there are three New Testament proofs that are offered as evidence proving this view. The first, the first New Testament proof is that dominion is due to humanity's sonship. The lordship and power of Christ over nature and creation highlight the true sonship of Christ. The second New Testament proof that is offered for this view says that humanity was intended to enjoy a close relationship with God as expected in sonship. Christ's relationship and subjection to his father underscores this relationship. And then a third uh, New Testament proof that is offered for this view says that glory image, and sonship are closely related. Christ was in God's image by way of sonship. This is stated in Colossians 1.15. Thus, he reveals and glorifies God. See John 1.14 and 18. Sonship was lost in the fall, or at least defaced, along with the ability to glorify God as a son. See Romans 3.23. So how should we respond to this um, view 
of the image of God, this understanding of the image of God. Well, this view is worth considering. It may have merit. However, McDonald's use of scripture should be questioned. McDonald is theor theologizing or theorizing. None of the scripture above makes an explicit statement along the line he is suggesting. The closest is Colossians 1.15, but it could be an identity statement, not a causal one. One would have to do exegesis and determine what the relationship is in this verse. So let's move on and let's look at Erickson's helpful three categories or three helpful categories. And these are three categories that are helpful in identifying what people are trying to do when they try to explain the image of God, okay? First, there are the substantive views. These are methods for explaining the image of God in as some def, definite characteristic or quality which constitute human nature. In other words, it is part of the substance of humanity that is identified as being the image of God. The, those views which stress humanity's bodily form or spiritual or soulish nature or rationality are of this sort. And the most common um, of these substantive views has been to place the stress on human reason. So that's the substantive view. Um, there are those who try to explain um, the image of God through relational views. Relational views try to define the image of God as our ability to experience relationship in some aspect. Bruner thinks it consists in the ability to relate to and respond to God. It is the act of response or relationship with God that defines the image. Certainly, we must have the appropriate structure in place, but that does not necessarily define the image. Of course, Bart, being closely aligned with Bruner, falls within this camp. Arguably, MacDonald might also fall in this arena as well, since he emphasizes the familial relationship of sonship. And then there is the functional view. And these views try to define the image of God as something humanity does. The most obvious um, way, the most obvious um, of these functional views is the dominion view. And perhaps the mirroring view falls here as well. So let's let's um, look at some observations that a number of people have offered on this topic. So here's what Wayne Grudem has to say on the image of God in humanity. He writes, the fact that man is in the image of God means that man is like God and represents God. This is a statement of the traditional reform view. Grudem also thinks that likeness qualifies image. He sees a distinction between the two. For him, image roughly equals representation and likeness roughly equals similar or similarity. This is not a representation with thus, it is not a representation with no correspondence in being. But at the same time, Grudem off differs from most systematic theologies in trying to stay away from actually defining the image. 
He says it is enough to say that human beings are like God. If we try to specify how, we cannot do adequate justice to the subject. Scripture doesn't really offer this definition. Rather, as we learn more about God and humanity, we increasingly see how we are like God and thus in his image. This might be the best way to reflect what scripture itself is reflecting without say, saying too much or too little about the image of day. We can also say that there is a correspondence between in being between God and humanity. So the scriptures seem to suggest a sub substantial, though limited likeness. For example, like God, humans are also able to create things, but on a far more limited scale. Now, here are some specific, but not exhaustive aspects of God's image in humanity. And so all of these that I'm about to mention, besides volition, are from Wayne Grudem. He keeps contrasting human characteristics with animals. So his focus, his approach focuses on the differences between human beings and animals as defining aspects of the Imago Dei. Thus, we are the height of God's creation and as such in the image of God. So this is how he goes about understanding it. First, there are there is the moral nature. That is, we have an inner sense of right and wrong. And our likeness to God is reflected when we act in conformity to God's moral standards. And so the flip side would be that when we do not act in conformity with his standards, we fail to reflect his image. Now, this moral nature leads to the fact that we are morally accountable before God. Because of this inner sense of morality, we are held responsible to God. God holds us personally responsible for our actions. Thus, moral behavior focuses on outward actions. Holiness and righteousness reflect inward character. In both cases, we are in the image of God. So this is one of the ways that we reflect the image of God through our sense of right and wrong and through the fact that we are morally accountable to God. And this leads to holiness and righteousness with respect to God. More, moral behavior reflects God's values and it's mostly thought of in terms of our behavior towards others. Holiness and righteousness also reflects God's values and character and focuses more on inner being and character in relation to God. So we see that as so we see what I said earlier. Moral behavior focuses on outward action. Holiness and righteousness reflect inward character. In both cases, we are in the image of God. Now, let's look at some spiritual aspects. Okay? We have a spiritual nature. We are not just physical bodies. There are also spiritual or immaterial aspects to our being that enable us to relate to God and to act in ways beyond mere physical existence. We have a spiritual life that relates to God. 
It is our spiritual nature that enables us to relate to God, to pray, to sense his presence, to receive and yield to the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, and so forth. And not only that, but we also have the gift of immortality. It is the fact that we are made in God's image that guarantees that we will live forever. Because God is without end, and therefore, like God, we also have the gift of immortality. Then there are some mental or cognitive aspects of our of, of the image of God within us. The first of these is rational ability. This consists in our ability to reason, to think logically, to establish understanding and relationships of things. We are not only able to think concretely or scientifically, but also philosophically and abstractly, okay? So not only can we think about things that are that we can touch and see and move, we can also think and talk about things that we cannot see or touch or otherwise manipulate. And going along with this rational ability is the gift of language. The fact that we have extremely complex language structures and capacities to communicate sets us apart from the animal world. We can communicate, communicate complex ideas and receive instruction that is different from our immediate experience. Grudem gives the example of telling his four-year-old to get a red-handled screwdriver from his toolbox. Now, a chimpanzee can learn this through repeated practice and reinforcement, but only this. The child may never have may have never seen that particular screwdriver before, and yet he can still do it. His grandfather says, go hand me the red-handled screwdriver. The child has never seen it before, but because of the gift of language and the gift of rational ability, he's able to put two and two together, rummages around in the toolbox, and ah, I have your screwdriver, Grandpa. Language and what can be communicated is much more complex and represent an ability that is a quantum leap beyond the capacity of even the most communicatively complex animal. We have, there's another example that we can point to. These have a complex pattern of communication, but the content of their communication is limited only to matters directly affecting their survival. So bees, for example, have this amazing ability to communicate with other bees where certain flowers are, and they can even tell the other bees what direction to go in and so forth. But again, that is that communication is related directly to their survival. They show no capacity for communicating about abstract things such as God or right and wrong, okay? So this is one of the ways that we humans are different from animals. Another way that we reflect the image of God is through human creativity. Like God, we are creative. We have had some wonderful achievements in art and technology. Yet we are all free, we are all creative in varying, varying degrees and ways, whether we are musicians, cooks, writers, or builders. 
C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien call this aspect of our imaging sub-creation and believed it to be a major aspect in our imaging God in the world as stewards of his creation. For example, when science fiction or fantasy writers do world building, they are reflecting the image of God. This is exactly what C.S. Lewis did with the Chronicles of Narnia, and this is exactly what J.R.R. Tolkien did with his Lord of the Rings series. Another way that we reflect God's character or God's image is through emotion. The fact that we feel draws another correspondence with God. Yes, animals have feelings too, but not only can we feel, but we can also express our feelings through writing, through poetry, through songs, um, in many different ways. Animals, on the other hand, when they express emotions, they're able to express their emotions in very limited ways. We also have volition. Volition means willpower or the ability to choose. This is the ability to discern and make choices, to mentally reflect on different options, anticipate outcomes, judge right and wrong, and then act, rather than just acting without intention or acting solely on instinct, okay? So this is one of the ways that we are different from animals. Because while animals can make choices, they do so on the basis of instinct. Humans can make choices on something, on the basis of something other than just instinct. Then there are the relational or social aspects of the image of God within us. Um, one of these is found in our sense of community and social relationships. While some animal species do demonstrate evidence of complex hierarchies, the fact that animals act solely on instinct means there is a qualitative difference between social relationships among animals and social relationships among humans. Human social interactions always have a moral and even spiritual dimension. And therefore, insofar as they live according to God's righteous character, human societies are able to reflect God's image. One uh, biblical example of this of this reality is found in relationships between parents and children, okay? Because the Bible does give us examples of godly parents and, and got even godly children, okay? And this leads us to marriage. Um, this kind of intimate and submissive relationship between husband and wife as well as the ability to relate to others socially is reflective of God's own ability to relate to other persons, both within the Trinity and with other persons. And this is, this is spoken of in the Bible itself, because the Bible tells, teaches us that the relationship between a husband and a wife is supposed, is supposed to be a parable or a living picture of Jesus' relationship with his church. Now, I do want to make it very clear that those who never marry are still able to reflect God's character in many other ways. And that this and marriage is not the only way that we are able to reflect God's image. God's ability to condescend 
also suggests that our ability to relate to all people, um, regardless of class, education, and experience, is part of how we reflect the image of God. Then there is dominion. We are like God in respect to creation. We are given a we are given dominion of the earth as God is Lord of it. And therefore, um, you know, in Genesis chapter one, verses 26 and 27, we read that God commanded us to rule over the earth and to subdue it. Now, this also means that we are responsible for how we rule over the earth. We are responsible for how we care for and manage God's creation. But still, the, the reality remains that, the, that our dominion over the earth is one more way that we reflect image of God within us. Now we come to the question of physical aspect. When we when he asks whether the image of God is born in any sense in our physical bodies as well as the more immaterial side, Wayne Grudem suggests yes. How might this be the case? Because you know if someone asks you, does God look like, do we look like God as in our human bodies? Well, we would most likely say no, because God is spirit. He took the form of Jesus when he, in the incarnation, but God himself is spirit. So how, how can Wayne Rudum suggest that in some ways, our physical bodies reflect God. Well, let's take a look. The first way is that our senses are like God. We hear and see, for example, in a mediated manner through physical organs, whereas God hears and sees, though without the mediation of physical organs. So, what Wayne Grudem is suggesting here is that the fact that we can see and hear is one of the ways that we are like God, because God can also see and hear. So even though God does not have eyes or ears, he can see and hear. We, on the other hand, are created so that we can see and hear through our eyes and our ears. sense of time and the future. Now, unlike God, we live in time because the Bible teaches that God is beyond time and space. He is outside of our time-space continuum. But like God, we can anticipate and plan for the future because the Bible clearly teaches that God does have plans for humanity. He has plans for our individual lives. He has plans for our families, our communities, our nations, and indeed for the entire world. We also have a sense of living beyond this physical life. In other words, we have this sense that death is not the end of the story. And we also have this sense or the feeling that we are more than mere physical beings. And so this is a sense of self-transcendence. And since God is transcendent, and we sense that we also have some, that we in some way are also transcendent, this is one more way that we reflect God's image within us. Now, the ability to procreate resembles God's ability to create human life. 
So the ability to bear and raise children resembles God's creation of human beings and his care for his creatures. While human bodies do not reflect God's literal form, they do reflect the wonderful abilities and creativity of God. And they show something of God's nature. In this respect, then, our bodies really do represent God. Okay. So we've looked at, we spent a lot of time looking at the image of God and, and trying to answer the question, how is it that we are created in the image of God? In what way do we reflect God's image? But now we need to note that God's image in humanity was marred, but not absolutely destroyed or lost. So when Adam and Eve disobeyed God by eating the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, about which God instructed them not to eat, the human image was um, damaged. But it was not absolutely destroyed or lost. And this is important to remember. This is reflected in Genesis 9, in the Genesis 9 and James 3 passages that we looked at during the first half of this video lecture. Also present within the New Testament is the idea of renewal. We talked about how because of Christ's work on the cross, because of his resurrection, because of what Christ is doing in us, he is now at work to restore the image of God, to make it, to restore it to what it was before the fall. Also represented in the New Testament is the idea that human beings continue in many of the traits which God has, although we are cut off from God. For example, reason, volition, moral capacity, etc., all still operate, although without the capacity or clarity that they once had. So what this is saying is that we have the ability to reason. Now, our reason has been affected by the fall. So this is why sometimes we make dumb decisions. And this is the reason, one reason why some of the really, really smart people make really, really dumb decisions. It's because of the effect of the fall. The same is true of these other things. You know, we still have the ability to make moral choices, but because of the fall, we often make mistakes. We often sin. And even when we're not trying to sin, and we try to make good choices, sometimes because of the fall, our moral decision-making is, is damaged in such a way that we might, you know, despite our best intentions, we may not, we may still make choices that are not completely good. God sees that they are good, and God graciously intervenes to make all things work out for good. But the fact still remains that because of the fall, we may still make mistakes in our decision-making, even if we are trying to do the right thing. And this is true in other ways. All these different aspects in which we reflect the Imago Dei have been marred or damaged by the fall. Yet, the wonderful news is that they are still there. And because God is at work in us to restore us, we have the promise that God will make, will cause all things to work together for the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose.
Now, in Christ, there are being, uh, all of these things are being renewed and are thus not necessarily limited to the character to um, to the characteristics of the image of God mentioned in Ephesians 4 and Colossians 3. And this is especially um, the case if the Imago Dei is understood in substantive terms rather than merely relational and functional. Our great value is founded upon our similarity to God and the purpose for which God created us. Human dignity, and therefore human right, is centered within the image of God in human beings. Um, during the past two to three hundred years, um, there has been um, a lot of movement beginning with the Western world and now spreading throughout the world to um, claim the rights of human rights, to argue that all humans have dignity. Um, and so during the last two to 300 years, there have been political and social movements to advance human rights and to advance human dignity. But the question is, what do we base human rights and human dignity on? Um, many modern political theories would base human rights and human dignity on some kind of social compact or some kind of social agreement. But the danger there is what happens if society changes its ideas about what rights are considered human rights or what happens if human society changes its ideas about what constitutes human dignity. This is why it is crucial that we ground our understanding of human rights and human dignity on the foundation of the image of God, because the image of God does not change since God himself does not change. If we are like God substantially, that is who we are, rather than what we do or what our relationship is, then it doesn't matter if a person is a non-Christian. And this is important because, you know, this means that human rights are the same for all people, regardless of whether we are Christian or not, because all of us have the image of God, whether we are Christian or not. Those who are not Christians are still worthy of human dignity, nor does it matter that someone is young, old, sick, retarded, physically deformed, orphaned, poor, etc. All people are bearers of the image of God. But the problem remains. The Imago Dei, since it is not defined completely, does not tell us in itself what the parameters or limits of human dignity and human rights are. Rather, we must look to the moral law in the Old and New Testament as reflective of God's nature and character and of his will for human relationships. So now we come to the end of this, the second part of this video lecture. So what we've done in this video lecture is we've looked at the question, who am I? And the question, how do we reflect the image of God? What is the image of God? And we saw that the Bible teaches very clearly what the image of God is, but it it does not spell out completely what the image of God is. 
And this is why there are many different ideas or many different explanations for what the image of God is. So, in one of the discussion questions I have for you on our discussion board is the question, what do you think the image of God is? If someone were to ask you to explain to them the image of God, how would you explain what the image of God is to them? So I look forward to reading your responses on the discussion board, and I look forward to discussing with you more about this question in our class sessions.